I'm here with Rabbi Dr. Josh Fagelson, who is a graduate of Yale, has a doctorate from Northwestern, uh, went to Yeshiva Tchobavei Torah, the rabbinical school where, where I also went, um, and is the founding director of Ask Big Questions, an initiative of Hillel, trying to engage students in uh, important conversations that really matter for their lives and beyond. And we're going to have a little conversation this afternoon around uh, Jews in higher education, mm -hmm. uh, one, of, one of the years of expertise of Rabbi Fagelson. First question I want to ask you is, what does higher education mean for American Jews and today, and what has it meant in the past? So, um, higher education, it, it's really interesting for the last at least two, probably three generations. Higher education has actually been like the single most defining feature hmm. of American Jewry, hmm. especially non Orthodox Jewry, non Haredi Jewry. Mm -hmm. So, since um, already in like 1920, 90% of City College was Jewish. Right? And actually, the figure at Harvard was also huge. Mm -hmm. right? um, and then we went through an area of sort of retrenchment and quotas. But in the post-war era, right? I mean, since the Second World War, something like today, 85 or 90% of American Jews go to college, bearing in mind that like 50% is maybe the American average of the population. Mm -hmm. So we blow away sort of any other ethnic population um, or religious community. And, um, and so it's really a, it's a huge defining feature. I think it's one we don't think about nearly enough. For American Jews, I think higher education has been associated with upward economic mobility, um, becoming part of the American intelligentsia, sort of you know, making it, mm -hmm. being successful. Um, but I think it's also been part of the secularization of American Jewry, mm -hmm. of uh, imbibing and, um, and contributing to uh, sort of secular values. And uh, and I think in a lot of ways we haven't been critical enough in our thinking about um, what are the questions that are being asked in universities and um, what questions would we need to be asked to be, the way I like to put it is that American universities today are really great at taking 18 year olds and helping them deconstruct their identities, mm -hmm. but then they do a really lousy job of helping 22 year olds put them back together. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so I think it behooves us to you know be really thinking about those questions. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I've heard from some Jewish leaders on campus over the last 10 years, that there's been a loss of the Jewish intellectual, that more Jews are going into business and law, not to disparage those fine careers, but there's less of Jews in humanities and Jewish leadership. Is, 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 is this your sense as well? And if so, why or why not? Um, I, don't, I, I, I don't have any data uh -huh. in front of me about uh -huh. it, so I, I, would, I would hesitate to, to, you know, to speculate on that. But... Um, I do think that you know we, we can we can see that um, uh, there is there I think there was a certain and maybe it's sort of a golden age I don't really generally believe in golden mm -hmm, ages mm -hmm. but like there's a thought that like you know if you look in the 1950s and 60s there were all these Jewish intellectuals there were journals and there was much more of that I don't think this is necessarily true I mean I think we're going to talk about Jewish studies mm -hmm. um, I think Jewish studies has proliferated it is you know pervasive on so many. Campuses. It's been a huge success story of American Jewish life, um, and I, I think that you know the, the intellectual question is really more of a broader American cultural question. Um, and a lot of what's happened in higher education, as the cost of higher education has risen and mm -hmm, so far mm -hmm. passed out, you know, outpaced inflation and wage growth, that there's more and more pressure for you know if you're going to spend tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars in a degree, but it damn well make it, you know, worth your while. Yeah. You know, so. so on this topic of Jewish studies, you know, when I was recently talking with Professor Jonathan Sarno, one of the yeah. leading American Jewish historians at the Association of Jewish Studies right now. Yeah, yes. and, and just a wonderful <laughs> human being. He, um, he said the Jewish studies programs have grown enormously throughout America, and I wonder, uh, in your opinion, what does this mean for acceptance of Jews in the academy, acceptance of Judaism in the academy? And also, you know, how does this affect the quality of life for Jewish students on campus? Yeah, I think um, clearly it, it, is, it is a huge positive, right, that there is a place for, Ju you know, for the academic study of Judaism, mm -hmm. for, Judaism to, for uh, Judaism and Jews and Jewish life to be studied in the, you know, alongside, um, you know, all the other things that are studying in universities. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think number one sort of says we're here and this is a serious area. Mm -hmm. And number two, mm -hmm. there's been a you know commitment of resources 
to make sure that that, you know, that that exists and continues. So I think that that's a great thing, and it opens up access to learning to lots of people. I think that um, what I've heard from my colleagues in Jewish studies on campuses now is, you know, just as the rest of us are responding to changes in demography and changes in what Jewishness means to students, um, you know, there's more and more of students not necessarily looking, you know, going into Jewish studies to become Jewish studies majors or whatever, but like they're trying to explore their identity. They have a girlfriend who's Jewish or mm-hmm. a boyfriend who's Jewish or they, you know, they want to learn a little more about it. And, um, and I think, you know, we're trying to figure out like, what does the future of Jewish studies, mm-hmm. what is the future of Jewish studies? But I, I have to believe there is definitely a strong future of Jewish studies. Right. I recall when I, I taught a, I taught a Jewish studies course at UCLA law school once and 18 out of 20 of the students were Gentiles. Yeah. Um, which was, which was fascinating to me, you know, so Having worked at Northwestern Hillel and really been involved with campuses and Hillels around the country, yeah. uh, I wonder, the, the thriving of Jewish life on campus, do you primarily see this based upon academic offerings and culture, or primarily due to social programs and offerings from outside institutions, or some kind of mix of the two? I mean, I think it's clearly, it, it, it's a mix. I mean, also, don't, don't forget that, like, you know, the presence of, of, of academic Jewish studies also uh-huh. means generally there are professors of Jewish studies, mm-hmm. many times, and, and, mm-hmm. and very often those people are leaders in their local Jewish communities, mm-hmm. right? So, you know, where I grew up in Ann Arbor, right, a lot of the Jewish leadership in the community was drawn from the Jewish studies professors mm-hmm. who were at the University of Michigan, right? And I think that's true in a lot of places. Um, I think that, you know, but I should, or and I should say, I think that, you know, the social connections that you form in college and that are part of university, you know, campus life are... Um, equally, if not more powerful, mm-hmm. right? And uh, and so I think Hillel's and Chabad and Maor and all the other organizations that are you know part of the the campus fabric these days have paid attention to that. It's like how do we create social connections? Um, you know, our friend colleague Dan Smokler, I mm-hmm. think, has written very well about this. That like ultimately the predictors for Jewish affiliation and Jewish identity, you know, as a as an as an adult have to do with your, you know, first and foremost, do you have Jewish friends, mm-hmm. right? And as well as Jewish knowledge, as mm-hmm. well as Jewish practice. But having Jewish friends in your social networks is their place. Yeah. Going back to the Jewish studies for just a moment. Yeah. Sometimes we see those professors within history departments. Mm-hmm. But I think more often than not, we see them within Israel, Middle Eastern studies departments. Should Jewish studies be separate from Israel, Middle, Middle Eastern studies departments or... Does it make sense to kind of lump those together? Well, I would say actually it, it's a little, maybe a little different in that uh-huh. I think that recently there's been a trend, there's been a big investment, the Schusterman Foundation has mm-hmm. been very involved in this, in um, in developing Israel studies uh-huh. as its own right. sort of discipline. Right. And in some places now, the question is where does that enter? Mm-hmm. And then there are political realities at Northwestern, you know, where, where, where I was, where I did my PhD, um, there were all sorts of questions of like, well, where is that going to sit? And ultimately, it did fuse with the Center for Jewish, it's not the Center for Jewish and Israel Studies, the Crown Center. Mm -hmm. Um, And, uh, you know, and and I'm not, I'm sort of not close enough to like, I think make a a real sort of um, judgment about like what's a very active Mm -hmm. topic. I will say that like, I mean, obviously, Elu va Elu in a certain Mm -hmm. sense. On the one hand, how can you talk about Israel without talking about its relationship with the rest of Jewish life. On the other hand, Israel is, you know, an independent political reality, and if you're going to have a Center for Israel Studies, that should sit alongside the Center for, you know, Latin American Studies mm-hmm. or European, you know, or Hungarian Studies or Russian mm-hmm. Studies or whatever. So, um, to the extent that these are nations or their cultures, I mean, like, then you get into the yeah. question of what's the relationship yeah. of Jews and Israel. Yeah. What do you think are the biggest challenges that American Jews on campus are going to have to face in the coming in the coming decades, and what do you think we need to do to ensure intellectual vibrancy um, on campuses in those coming decades, yeah. given those obstacles? So I think, um, you know, I think the inc- there have been prediction there have been predictions about revolutions in higher education uh-huh. for a very long time, um, technological revolutions, etc. Um, I don't know what's going to happen. Nobody knows what's going to happen in American mm-hmm. higher education. People have been now for a number of years predicting that, you know, the cost is so immense and the technology is now exists that we're going to have a new model that will emerge that will be mm-hmm. like that Khan Academy or, you know, MOOCs or whatever. And here locally at, you know, ASU, they're definitely experimenting with that. 
at the same time, you know, everyone I talk to, and you know, even here, the embodied present conversation that you can have, mm-hmm. the college, Ameri- the, the American college experience has helped to develop um, and has been quintessential for American colleges, I think is an irreplaceable thing. And so I don't think the desire for that or the need for that is going away. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm not sure exactly mm-hmm. what it looks like. I do think that um, cost is, for everyone, is a, is a real issue. I think that um, uh, we are going to, when you're talking about vibrancy and intellectual vibrancy, that cost driver, right, is related to then, well, what do people study? And we have to always make sure in higher education that it's not just about, um, our success metrics aren't just about, uh, you know, did people find a job that pays well, Mm -hmm. right? It's also about, are you a good person? And, you know, are you living a good life and an engaged citizen in the world and a member of your community? And so um, I think that, you know, that's, Mm -hmm. that's a, that's something that we have to pay attention to. We need to be part of that conversation. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to be leading that conversation as Jews, Mm -hmm. right? And not just sort of passive actors and letting other people decide that. Mm -hmm. My uh, last question for you. Given the influence of higher education on the American Jewish community and vice versa, let's say there's a donor who has a large sum of money and is thinking where they want to leave their legacy. Mm. And one of the options is higher education, given that influence and that value. Um, and knowing in your head the other two other options are investing directly in the American Jewish community or addressing the vulnerable in the world, mm-hmm. the, the poor, or even hospitals for that, for that matter. What kind of values discourse would you engage with that donor? And do you think it is... It is a fair and, and prudent Jewish choice to continue to invest in higher education as a primary philanthropic channel for, for, for American Jewish philanthropists. Um, I mean, I would say, you know, it depends. <laughs> it's one who depends on philanthropy myself. Uh-huh. Uh, you know, it depends, obviously, on, you know, the values of the philanthropist. And you said it's a values conversation. I think, you know, um, I remember when I, when, when I was in Yeshiva that Rabbi Saul Berman once gave a... Uh, a wonderful uh, shiur where he talked about like how thinking about how you apportion your tzedakah right and thinking about you know, that a portion of it goes to you know like like we would do maser only that you you know a portion of it has to go to directly helping the poor a portion of it goes maser goes to the levy right and so that's really about talmud torah about like how are you ensuring mm-hmm. education mm-hmm. a portion of it goes to um, uh, uh, to maaser sheni that you have to then eat in Jerusalem your own spiritual growth. Right, and so, um, and, and a portion of it goes into you know paying for mm-hmm. we, we pay for communal needs, you know, shkalim and, and other things that we that we that we invest in. So I think trying to identify like, well, what's the mix? What is your philanthropic investment mix look mm-hmm. like, and how is that reflective of your priorities and your values? I would say like, if American, if there are philanthropists who are who, who care about American Jewish life, the best investment to me is <laughs> get more kids at an early age knowing and understanding Hebrew mm-hmm. um, uh, and mm-hmm. in a relationship, you know, in a community where Hebrew is alive, I believe that like... Why Hebrew? Because I think, it, I think, I think yeah. that Hebrew opens up the door uh-huh. to everything else. Uh-huh. And if you, if you have it, you have, the, you have the key to like the rest of Jewish life. And if you mm-hmm. don't, it's, it's, it's much, it's very different. Mm-hmm. And so um, I think that's a huge, that's a huge thing and help, helping to create uh, Jewish communities. Um, Stephen Cohen, I think, has written about that, or I remember him saying to me once, I think he's written about this, but that you, there's strong predictive value of the things that you do before the age of 15 have much greater predictive value than anything we do in college, mm-hmm. which is not to undermine investing in Hillel, you should right. give to Hillel. But, uh, uh-huh. um, but it is to say that the stuff we do beforehand, you know, you want to help Jewish life on campus, send us stronger Jewish students when they arrive on campus. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Fascinating. Rabbi Dr. Josh Bagelson, check out the wonderful work he's doing at Ask Big Questions at Hillel's uh, Around the World, and uh, his uh, wonderful writings, one of our leading thinkers of higher education today and value and identity formation on campus. Thank you so Great. much. Thanks for